Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. I'm Cheryl and I am the Carb Addiction RD. As a dietitian, I'm always concerned about whether my patients are getting the appropriate amount of nutrients from their diet, both macronutrients and micronutrients. So today, I'd like to talk about how many rocks you should be eating. Now, I'm not talking about the gravel from your driveway, but did you know that salt is a rock? Here is a big slab of beautiful rock. In fact, salt is the only rock that we eat. And it's a pretty important but controversial micronutrient. Salt is one of the five known tastes that our tongue can recognize, suggesting that perhaps salt plays a really important role in our nutrition. In fact, like other animals, humans can and will seek out salt when they need it. Salt is mined from the earth or gathered from briny waters, including the ocean. Refined salt, otherwise known as table salt, is simply sodium chloride with a little bit of iodine added in, while unrefined salt contains other minerals such as iodine, magnesium, potassium, and calcium. One source of confusion for people is the way the terms salt and sodium are used interchangeably. In fact, these two terms do not mean the same thing. For a chemist, salt simply means a molecule that has a cation, which is positively charged, joined to an anion, which has a negative charge. So if we take the example of salt or sodium chloride, we know that that is a combination of a positively charged sodium connected to a negatively charged chlorine. Now the weight of the sodium is 23 Daltons, while the weight of the chlorine is 35 Daltons. So that means that more of the molecular weight of sodium chloride consists in the, of the chlorine. So for example, if we were to consider one gram of sodium chloride, that would have 400 milligrams of sodium and 600 milligrams of chlorine. So if we um, want to talk about salt or sodium, we need to be really clear as to whether we're talking about sodium or sodium chloride. Okay, so let's consider some numbers. One gram is the same thing as 1,000 milligrams, and one gram of salt is the equivalent of about one-sixth of a teaspoon of sodium chloride. Just under half a teaspoon of salt will provide you with 2.5 grams of salt, which contains one gram of sodium. But we also need to consider the type of salt we are talking about. One teaspoon of fine table salt contains about 2,325 milligrams of sodium, while the coarser sea salt has 1,120 milligrams of sodium. The percentage of salt in our bodies is very close to that of the ocean, which, according to one theory at least, is where we evolved from, so that makes intuitive sense. The body content of sodium in an average adult male is 92 grams, with about half of that located in the extracellular fluid at a concentration between 136 and 142 milliequivalents per liter. Extracellular fluid means the fluid that is outside of the cells. So we're talking about blood plasma, the fluid that bathes the space between our cells, and the lymphatic fluids. 92 grams of sodium is the equivalent of about 16 teaspoons of sodium, or about 40 teaspoons of salt. While there is a bit of nuance to these numbers, the general consensus among every organization that makes dietary recommendations is that we will be getting enough sodium if we consume 1,500 milligrams per day and we should not exceed 2,300 milligrams per day, which corresponds to somewhere between a half and one teaspoon of salt per day. Estimates from urinary excretion and food frequency questionnaires which one might argue is kind of dodgy science, from NHANES survey data suggests that the average American actually consumes 1.5 teaspoons of salt per day. Now, we all know that too much salt raises our blood pressure and can cause strokes and heart disease, right? So obviously, if we're consuming two to three times the amount of salt that we're supposed to, we're all gonna die, right? Let's think about this a little bit. 
So our bodies have really efficient pathways to get rid of any excess dietary sodium. And when sodium is in short supply, we're also really efficient at preserving the sodium that we have by reducing the amount of urinary output or the amount that we sweat. Sodium is the major mineral in the extracellular fluid volume, and it's really well controlled. The body really wants to keep that really tight control of the sodium concentration in the blood. So since water always follows sodium, when the concentration of sodium is within the physiological range in the blood, that means you're in fluid balance. In fact, if your sodium levels fall outside of that very tight range, you're pretty sick. Because if there isn't enough sodium in the body fluids, then those fluids will lose their water, become dehydrated, reduce blood pressure, and can even cause death. Now inside the cell is a really different story. The concentration of sodium inside the cell is significantly lower than it is outside of the cell. The cell membranes have transport pumps that actively move sodium out of the cell and bring potassium in. And that's to maintain those um, concentration differences between the outside and the inside of the cell. This pump burns energy in the form of ATP and it drives the importation of things like glucose, amino acids, and other nutrients that the cell needs. It also provides electrical impulses that enable muscle contractions. I'm not just talking about this one, folks. It's also that heart that needs to pump. And it also uh, promotes a transmission of nerve impulses. Think about your brain connections. Um, without sodium, this pump can't work. And mm, yeah, that's death pretty quickly. So when we consume salt in our food, the sodium is absorbed from the intestines into the cells that line the GI tract. Let's take a look at what's going on there. The intestines are on the right side of this graphic and they contain sodium from a meal. This bolus of food is called chyme, and it has a sodium concentration of about 142 milliequivalents per liter, the same as your blood. Remember that inside the cells, the concentration is lower, so sodium will diffuse across the cell membrane, going from a place of high concentration in the gut to a place of low concentration in the cells, and this is represented by the dashed lines. The cells, however, want to return to that lower concentration, so they pump out the excess, as seen by the heavy red arrows, using those sodium-potassium pumps. The sodium is pumped into the extracellular fluid. Remember, this includes the blood, the fluid between cells, and the lymph. And the water passively follows into the same space, but between cells in the area called tight junctions, rather than through the cells. After the nutrients from your food have been absorbed from the intestines, the leftovers arrive in the colon. The primary task of the colon, I mean aside from moving fecal matter, is a reabsorption of sodium and water. We know this because patients with irritable bowel disease have difficulty reabsorbing sodium, and patients who've had sections of their colon removed also have problems with sodium and water depletion. So, in the colon, water is reabsorbed to the extracellular fluid with the amount determined by the sodium content of that chyme and the integrity of the cells that line the colon. Dysfunctional cells will permit too much water to pass through, and we call this diarrhea. If there's insufficient sodium present in the chyme, the colon can't hold on to as much water, so more will be reabsorbed and Leave, that leaves behind dry fecal matter, and we call that constipation. Yes, I said it. It's not fiber that makes soft poop, it's the sodium. In fact, I have heard of a cure for constipation called a saltwater flush. Basically what you do is dissolve two teaspoons of non-iodized salt in four cups of warm water, and then you drink it. Folks, this laxative effect is powerful. Don't leave home after you've had this to drink. But it also makes one think that if you're suffering from constipation, maybe a little bit more salt in your diet might be helpful. So with the right amount of sodium, we get an appropriate fluid volume and thus a healthy blood pressure. But how is this controlled? Well, our bodies are so smart, they might even be smarter than research scientists. There is a short-term response called the baroreceptor reflex 
Baroreceptor cells are specialized cells located near the heart, and they can sense tension or stretch in the blood vessels, and they will activate the central nervous system to increase the heart rate when blood pressure is too low, or decrease the heart rate when blood pressure is too high. In a second mechanism, cardiac cells produce something called atrial natriuretic peptide, or ANP for short, and this is in response to elevated blood pressure. ANP is a diuretic, which means that it causes the extracellular fluid volume to be increased, um, that means you're urinating more, and that will thus decrease the blood volume, which decreases the blood pressure. There's also a long-term mechanism called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, or RAAS for short. This is a pretty complex system, but what it does is it stimulates secretion of aldosterone, which causes the kidneys to retain more sodium and to excrete more potassium. When sodium is retained, the less urine is produced, eventually causing the blood volume to increase. It also can cause the pituitary gland to secrete vasopressin, which is an antidiuretic hormone, which causes the kidneys to conserve water. So we have ANP, which is a diuretic, and we have vasopressin, which is an antidiuretic. So one would think that these, the interplay of these mechanisms will keep us ticking along pretty nicely, uh, with sodium playing a key role. Um, but I know you have questions, like, why did salt become demonized? And if the body is so good at regulating blood pressure, then why are so many people diagnosed with hypertension? This topic really needs a deeper dive, so I hope you will tune in to my next video where we explore salt a little bit more. Thank you for watching. Bye.